Good evening, everybody, to all the new ones. Please check out the chat down somewhere down below so you can you can directly interact with us. And I am now in a moderating position. So I, it's, it's definitely not me telling you stuff about the market. We have the, in my opinion, our most awesome partner I could find in, in the international team. And I'm super excited for them that they take the, their time for the preparation and also share their know-how with you guys. They, they see themselves in the Loxon family. They don't see like, uh, you guys are also selling Loxon. Why should I show you how, how we do it? So it's, it's completely the opposite. And I super appreciate uh, this fact. Also, I want to give you the goal of this webinar. We brought up the best guys so you can learn from the best in their fields to learn best practices to also show them so you will learn today how to create your own margins because the whole the whole topic of this webinar somehow started in our whatsapp group in the international whatsapp group where somebody brought up the topic like hey with the locks on margins with 17 percent discount and uh, how should i how should i make money with it and this whole discussion which which was created after this led to this topic and i truly believe by heart that with Loxone, it's different than with other systems. You're not selling something like a relay, you're selling functionality. And once you understand, and this is what the topic of today, the first topic of today will be to sell functionality instead of components, then you are the boss of your own margins. And this will be the first part. I don't want you to be the leader on your market. I want you guys to dominate the automation market. I want you to be the ones who don't, there, there is no competition. There is domination that I want for all of you. And the coolest part about tonight is that we will cover, cover different market situations. And we will kick this off with the first presentation of Henning. He is our platinum partner in Norway. I know him since many, many years. He's a good friend of mine, meanwhile. And we drank one or maybe some of the other beers together already in the show home. He is talking about how to sell as an electrician to the end client. So super excited. The next one will be also an highlight, which is done by Nick, our platinum partner of Malta. And he has the role of a system integrator and he will more talk about how to, to scale your business. Where, where are the limits? How many projects can you handle? And if you do them with third electricians which are not in your company what is especially what is special about this situation how can you make sure that all of this makes sense at the end and the electrician have all the right information that they need and then gavin the last highlight is talking about what to do with investors with tenders with architects he's our gold partner of dubai so a completely different market and that's it from my side and now i hand it over to you Henning. Thank you very much. Really appreciate the opportunity to uh, to be a um, part of this um, community, so to say, uh, and to contribute with what I know. Um, have been working. Uh, yeah, one moment. I have also a presentation I can uh, share with you guys. Uh, here's, let's see there. This one. Can you see it now, Richard? Yes, we do. Ah, perfect. Perfect. So, uh, <laughs> tell, tell a few words about myself first. <laughs> yes, this is me in Kollerslag, uh, making an AMG Mercedes drunk with one of the beers left over from uh, <laughs> an evening with Richard. <laughs> This is the story for another time, but um, it was Thursday. <laughs> it's a short story. <laughs> um, we've been working with Luxon since 2014. Uh, I think we attended one of the first ever English trainings in Kallerslag. Um, I also added my, um, my uh, contact information here. Uh, so you can see uh, or contact me in LinkedIn or whatever if someone has any questions or want to look up. 
Uh, also, why I'm the CEO or also a co-founder of Autobolig together with my good friend Eric. So, but that's enough enough about me. Just to set the stage. I have a quote here, which I think is really really great. Um, took this from a book, which I once got recommended. It's a great book on sales especially to make new business. Um, but discovery precedes presentation, always. Uh, today, I'm going to talk a little bit about universal sales principles first, uh, which I think applies really well to the situation where you as an electrician sitting down with the customer uh, and, and want to, to get through to them uh, and, uh, and make looks own within their home. So with this, uh, this quote, uh, I mean, learn to know your customer. I don't think never ever has anyone bought something because you want to sell it. Everyone wants to solve a problem or meet a desire. That's how it is. If you buy a car, the car seller can love the car. If you don't like it, you won't buy it. That's how it is. So what I think is a great thing to do is take on a genuine desire to help your customers solve their problems and meet their desire. Um, listen to them, understand them, ask questions, probe, get the customer talking about what are their dreams, what, uh, what do they want for their new home and so on. Listen and of course learn. There's extremely much to, to get out of a customer that want to share their dreams with you. Hence the quote, discovery precedes presentations. <laughs> Learn your customers first. And also uh, map out the stakeholders always. This is more in the focus in uh, B2B selling. But I can share a little story. Um, I once sat with, uh, with a guy. It was a family guy. They had a son. Let's call him John. He was three years old and uh, a newborn baby and a wife. They were going to, to build a house. And um, I sat with, with uh, John's father. Uh, we talked about the solution. He thinks it's great and everything. And uh, I was sure this is, uh, he, he wants this solution, no doubt about it. And I was right, he, he wanted the solution. However, uh, he also has a wife. Uh, and uh, she's a lovely lady, by the way. Uh, <laughs> but the thing that did happen, because I did not consider her as a stakeholder in this process, because he, for me, seems the, the one who made the decisions. However, he went home and tried to sell my solution to his wife. I didn't get to sell the solution to his wife and he couldn't do it because she only saw the extra costs. She wanted the, the, the stone countertop instead. <laughs> and eventually I, I convinced her to join me in a meeting together with, uh, with a man. And we sat there talking and uh, the topic of night lights got up. Um, and all of a sudden she just, oh, maybe I don't have to clean the toilet every morning if the lights goes on and, <laughs> and John will hit the toilet. <laughs> and right there, uh, she saw the value of, of the system. <laughs> she, <laughs> then this was not just any technical thing anymore. It was real life value for her. Uh, so always bring up the stakeholders, <laughs> even if they're there's a father or the bank uh, actually lost the sales to the bank one time. Ah, another story for another time. And never forget, you have two ears and one mouth, use them accordingly. <laughs> listen, always listen. There's always a desire there. 
And after you have learned what your customer wants, what are their needs, what are their, their life about, acknowledge, of course, you sit there with a customer of many. Uh, you can't not take their whole life story into consideration, but do get to know them first. Do not simply answer your customer's ask. I don't know, I have done it myself a lot of times. You get a list of components. We want this and this and this and this. Please give me an offer. What is happening? Nothing. You just use time to, to create the offer. You don't get the sale actually because yeah, there's no value in it. It's just a bunch of components and it compares you with the next door guy. So be different. Um, provide Genyan care. I think the Genyan care and the Genyan, let's say, curiosity into your customers' needs and everything, you'd be different. All of a sudden, you differ from, from your neighbor uh, electrician. Uh, all of a sudden, you are the trusted one because you actually takes time to listen and to provide Genyan care and counsels to your customer. What do you think? Okay, I'll learn this about you. And I think this will be a good solution for you. And of course, propose, always propose. Um, I hear a lot from colleagues in the branch and no one around here will ask for smart homes. All right, do they know what a smart home is? I usually ask them because if you don't propose the solutions, the customer don't know what it is. Uh, for a lot of people, smart homes is just for nerds. It's just for the technical interested. Uh, you need to propose the solution and all also um, create a value in it, which we will soon talk about. So I, I asked the question here. Let's say you sit there with a the customer and usually we do this, we prejudge what the customer thinks is expensive because they always complains about the money, even at early stage. So to propose a smart home would seem insane, but it isn't. Um, let's say, turn the situation around. You're sitting there with the customer. Let's say this was your best friend. Would you then like them to know whether or not this is possible? Would you then give them all the opportunities so they can make the decision? We don't know what's the value for a smart home system for the customer before we have proposed it. If we initially think, no, 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 they don't have the money to do it, then they, they won't know about it anyway. So uh, propose the solutions, talk with the customer about it and connect it to their needs. Another little story. Um, Actually, it, uh, it hangs on the first bullet point there. I have two kids, lovely kids. My boys seem to be 10 year and my daughter is six years old. And um, as a parent, I have a great responsibility, of course, for, for them and I love them with all my heart. Um, if I would to ask them every day what they want for dinner, <laughs> you have the answer to the right here. Uh, that's the same thing as asking your customer what you want. I need to make sure they get the nutrition, what they need, and sometimes what they want, of course. Uh, but um, we are the experts. We should also propose the best solutions. The customer don't know. We work with this every day. So to the bottom line, first of all, all of us want to sell. Uh, that's what we live off. If we don't sell, we don't have anything to do. We want to sell. And of course, uh, as Richard mentioned initially, uh, we, um, we don't sell products, we sell solutions. That's the key here, because if you look at the margins from the list price and so on, it's just, nothing do people live in a fuse box no of course they don't uh, and again sell solutions not pro products 
And with that, there is absolutely no needs for part lists in your offer. It's not necessary because what, what is the value of a mini server? 500 and something euros? I don't know. The mini server is worthless until we have programmed it. It's just a piece of plastic and electronics. This is nothing uh, before, before we program it. And what we program and put into the mini server, there is where the value is. So put it another way. Uh, what is the value of having a notification when the kids are home from school? Unlock the door. All right, William is home. Perfect. I know his did. I know he didn't wander off with a friend or something. He's home and safe. Or what about the value of having a good night's sleep? Because the shading made sure during the day your house were not overheated. That is invaluable for everyone. So sell those things, focus on the real life experience. That's really important. As in the example with, with John, for example, tell stories about uh, how the customer can feel secure, the comfort of night lights, uh, the convenience of, uh, convenience of uh, NFC code touch, Everything, just hook it up on the, um, yeah, what you learn from the customer <laughs> in the initial, initial meetings. And my kind of field advice, and I think Luxon uh, shared the same, uh, same, same principle with me because I have uh, been a thief on their website. I'll in a minute show you. But we like in Autobully to present three options. One basic option and one mid-range option and one premium option. Uh, that way you provide two things. The customer gets a reference point and always aim for what you think the customer wants in the middle one. If the customer is really hooked up on energy management, okay, then put in the energy meters in the middle package. If the customer is really uh, into, let's say, colored lightning, put it there and so on. So aim with the middle one and propose three options. With prices and everything, just like buying a car. You always get three proposals for this snow. Nothing I come up with. Uh, and also another tip, put some energy making some stunning templates. It's a great thing to do and you can use them over and over again. Uh, it's something the customer can bring home. And if you didn't stake out, uh, map out the stakeholders and talk to the wife, <laughs> then at least you have control of what we being presented. So I recommend you to uh, have a look on um, one of the web pages of uh, the Luxon.com page. I don't remember the URL. Maybe you can put it in the chat, uh, Richard. I will share this. it tomorrow in the follow-up email. Yeah, perfect, perfect. This is a great example of how to do it. You have one home, three packs or three options put in. Basic, medium, and exclusive. Um, and here you have the Luxon has also presented the, the list price of the components and so on. But look at all these features. I tell you what, all these functions, even at the, at the smallest pack, I think uh, is 34 five functions or something, uh, that's a lot higher value than 2,500 euros. <laughs> this, is a, a, this is a totally different home than the home with the traditional installation or a simpler system. This is worth a lot of money and has a great value for the customer. This is what you need to sell. Then to sum up, this is you guys succeeding with, with selling <laughs> off to the moon. <laughs> don't be a dog. Listen, remember, don't serve pancakes. Move out of the fuse box and make sure John hit the ball. <laughs> Thanks. That was, that was super brilliant, Henning. <laughs> Thank you for this 
presentation. So all of so Nick and Gavin, you two guys, you have uh, big footsteps to to jump into. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> That's awesome. So, also to me, I had a lot, I had a lot of points uh, which which I noted here during your presentation. And for me, one one key point was like the customer is king. That's the the old saying. But a, a good king should have good consultants. And this is where where you guys position yourselves. And I, I think this is super brilliant. And also the fact that you said that you actively have to propose because at, at least where where most, most of the electricians I talk to when I, when I, I ask them, hey, um, do you have time for projects or are you fully booked? They like typically have a pulse of 20 because they're, the whole year 2022 is already fully booked and they don't have to sell stuff originally or it's, it's something new. It's an opportunity for you guys. So to actively promote or uh, propose Luxon in terms of features, functionalities, I think there you're perfectly on point. Brilliant. So there will be a question Q&A round at the end of the three presentations. So feel free to ask in the chat right away or at the end. And then I hand over to Nick. And I'm super excited for your presentation, not only because you have a brilliant green screen, <laughs> but also because I believe that you have truly understood your business as a system integrator to to scale your business, to work with other electricians and how you can benefit from them, but also how they can benefit from you. So I give it over, hand it over to you. Thank you, Richard. Can you see the screen well? Because I'm not sharing screen. I'm just putting a picture in picture thing here. It's fine. That's all okay. Great. So um, yeah, before I start, I'm likely to be a bit fast and I appreciate there's members in the audience who are not native English speaking so just hit Richard in the chat if I do go too fast and I'm sure he'll stop me and slow me down uh, just be mindful I only have 20 minutes and a lot to talk about so <laughs> on that note let's go um just want to set the stage um first of all you know it's wonderful being part of our great community I love how WhatsApp every day of the week, Monday to Sunday is going. If anyone can help anyone, it's, it's really wonderful and it's really great to feel, to feel part of this. Um, you know, life's a fantastic journey in which we're always learning um, and improving. And the fact that we can support each other doing that is absolutely, um, absolutely great. So I'm not sitting here pretending to be some expert. I'm pretty sure that a lot of you, I know Henning already practices a lot of what I'm going to say. <laughs> so I'm sure a lot of you, um, a lot of you could probably teach me a thing or two as well. So please take what I'm going to present with with a pinch of salt. Henning, thank you. Um, it was really interesting to follow. Thank you, especially for leaving just a few extra minutes because you didn't use all your 20. So maybe I steal some. If I'm feeling kind, I share one or two with Gavin. We'll see. Um, but I, I start this image in really quick because you set the bar really high. And in the beginning, I was like following. I was like, yeah, we're singing from the same song sheet. Okay, so here goes. Here goes. I also wanted to start by talking about selling before jumping straight into how we do it um, with Loxone. I call it the art of selling, and it's going to sound very familiar to, uh, to Henning now. Um, I have a personal golden rule, which I do try to instill in everybody um, in the company. And that golden rule is believe in what you are selling whether it's a service, whether it's a product, whatever it is. Otherwise, don't try to sell it at all. And the reason I say that is because, in my opinion, a great salesperson is a person who can make a connection with the customer. And how do they do that? And the great thing is it's not rocket science. It's actually really easy. Listen. <laughs> <laughs> this is all going to sound familiar, Henning. Start by listening to your customer. And actually, it's so familiar because I was going to say before we go out there barking about everything we have to say, <laughs> but I'm going to have to try to use a different adjective now. Um, and ask lots of questions apart from listening. The Americans coined something like, what are your pain points? So why are you looking for a solution? today in our case with selling locks on and automation. Um, what isn't working for you? What would you like to improve? 
ask them about aspirations, um, what's making them think of automation, what's making them think of improving or changing or whatever. And last but not least, there is a third one, which I thought was overlooked. Henning obviously doesn't overlook it. And that is understand your customers' understanding of what they're asking about. How do you think this is going to improve your life? And what's your understanding of automation? Because perhaps you might need to educate them a little bit further um, than what they already think and know. Be mindful that they're not only talking to you, they're going to be collecting a number of quotes and speaking to a number of people. Now, once you've listened, asked as many questions as you can, gotten to know your customer a little bit, there and then on the spot, if you truly understand them, you can speak to them. And when you do speak to them from their point of view, so you're starting to tick the boxes about the mental notes or notes you've taken during that research bit of listening and asking questions, something magic happens when you start answering those questions. The customer feels without saying it, this person gets me. Isn't that wonderful when it happens to us, when we're on that side of the fence, we're looking for something or we're trying to buy something and someone gets us when we're trying to explain what we want. Be mindful of that because it is the foundation to building trust. And that's really important with our topic here today as well, because we're starting relationships with our customers. It's a long-term relationship because we're bound to an after-sales service. We're not a real tail shop. Here's a box off the shelf. Ciao, bye, see you. And we always should be honest with the customer. Sometimes they may ask a question that we're not 100% sure of. Now, believe me, customers can smell bullshit a mile off. There's absolutely nothing wrong in telling a customer, I'd like to cross-check myself on that. I'd like to check something out. They'll only respect you, possibly, trust you even more. And on that note, always be mindful of who you're speaking to. Is it another electrician? Is it an engineer? Or is it somebody who automation is, let's say, Japanese for them? Apologies to anyone Japanese in the audience, by the way. So make sure you speak in a language that they can understand and not with acronyms and trying to be the expert and show off. Be approachable and be humble. And before I move on, these are tips. They're not tricks. You have to believe in what you're saying. And that's why my golden rule is that. Otherwise, don't try to sell it at all. So how do we do it? How do we approach um, selling locks on? Well, let's put things into context first. What are we selling? To switch or not to switch? It's not a question anymore. So when we're speaking to the customer, dear customer, we're selling automation and we are so much more than the competition. And it's important to remember that last question I asked when I said, listen to the customer, what is their understanding? Because a lot of our competition bans the word automation about like crazy. But half of them are not offering real automation. They're offering smart homes, your home in your hand, your home in an app or something like this. Now, switching is secondary. Okay, maybe today you have a phone or a device or something in your hands and you approach your smart home that way. Even with Loxone, we have a fantastic app, which is always improving, but it's secondary. We're selling lifestyle. We're selling a solution, an experience. It's primary and it's primary through the sensor. When you walk into a lock zone space, it intelligently sets the scene, sets the mood. And it does it intelligently, not because it goes to the same old, same old line of code every time, like a lot of the competition does. It uses sensors and whatever we creatively bundle together and concocts for the customer so that it will set the scene 
according to the given circumstance at that moment in time. And that sets us apart. Now, when you're trying to sell this to the customer or educate the customer on this, the magic happens when Loxone is experienced, when it's explained well in a Loxone kind of environment, we find that Loxone actually sells itself. Now, we all know this picture. This is the show space in Austria of one of them. This is not our picture, but we believe in what I'm saying so much in our company that we're currently finishing off building a 90 square meter show space, which is not ready yet, but that's how much we believe in it. We've seen the results. And up until that show space is ready, I'm going to give you a tip of what we've done till today to facilitate showing the customer. Now we all have a demo case, perhaps we have two, perhaps we have three. And you can use the demo case, you can combine demo cases together, but sometimes, just sometimes, might need a little bit more, depending on the circumstance. Henning, towards the end, mentioned presentations and how important it is to impress and, and, and make a nice template and format for them and everything. And it's really important to present and to demo, to experience. Um, one case is we had a commercial building which had approached us. It was a couple of stories of offices with underlying car parks. Um, and the client wanted to set himself apart with the rest of the competition in our market, and he wanted automation. And his engineer was really skeptical about automation. So we thought, hmm, how are we going to convince this guy? Well, we put our money where our mouth is. Yes, said it the right way. We built a demo case on steroids, if you like. I'm not going to explain to you how the demo case works because you guys possibly know that even better than I know it. But the reason we put three um, mini servers into this demo case, which you can see behind me, was we wanted to show the customer live that if one mini server had to go down, it doesn't put the whole system down. So we use this to demonstrate tree into communication to show that if you trigger something like a fire alarm, it will trigger over all of the other floors in this case, because each mini server represented a floor. We deliberately, because we had separate circuit breakers for them, turned one off so that you could see that you could still trigger a fire alarm and it would still work across the other floors and so much more. When the customer wanted a meeting with us, we asked them, and I'm going to touch more about this later, if they had this engineer and this electrician, and they did. And we made sure that they had them in the meeting. And with this demo case, unbelievably, it took us one meeting to convince the customer. And we left that meeting discussing next steps. Because in that meeting, we explained everything to the electrician and to the engineer in technical jargon. We made sure the customer could follow and could understand. Customer was super impressed because engineer was being satisfied in every question he threw at us, even if it took a few minutes to do something quickly in config, we could do it. Obviously we were a team tagging each other, okay, on that. And the customer was sold there and then. That's the power of demonstration. When we realized this power, we love in our company selling tree technology. It's something we really love. We think it's fantastic. And it's, it's one of the things that does set locks on apart. And one of the fantastic things about tree technology is the fact that you can put 50 devices on one wire. Now it's one thing saying it and explaining it, perhaps an electrician can get it around his mind, but to a customer, what does it mean? So we took demo a step further. And this is a demo on steroids, not that box. This is 50 Loxone devices, lights, actuators, present sensors, touch pures. I think there's a window shades device, a couple of nanos in there. There are 50 devices on this board made to look like an apartment, obviously completely off scale, basically. But what's also off scale is how people react to this. 
when they see it. Because we can explain the whole concept of automation to them, of functionality to them with it. We can show them how everything is really on one wire. So when you tell them you save 80% of copper, they know it's true. They don't think it's some marketing gag so that you buy from them because it can sound a little bit like that. We save you 80%. We save you 50,000 um, tasks a year. They're great lines, but they can sound maybe a bit cheesy sometimes unless they're demonstrated properly. And after explaining the whole thing, we put the app in someone's hand. We tease them a little bit and we tell them, here, play with your future home. If there's an electrician, we have the back exposed and they can see it and since since we did this we have electricians calling us up saying hey can we bring a customer we'd like to show them this and they're booking appointments with us for it at the same time we wanted to demonstrate another little thing because seeing is believing and we built a mock-up kitchen which you can see behind me you all know the mechanics of how it would work we have a bucket underneath we have a pump so we can circulate water between the tap and the buckets basically there's a motorized valve and all of that, and we showed water leak detection. Don't need to tell you about that. Again, you probably know more than me about how to put it together. But what we did for the purpose of the demo was we had two motorized valves, one in C2 within the pipework, and one also connected, but showing on the counter. So that also um, Mrs. Customer could appreciate what was going on as well. That's a very important thing. And we took advantage of showing off the touch surface. Why don't you, whilst you're at it? And a couple of pendulums hanging up there so we can show the reaction as well. And we had another touch surface, non-commissioned in our hands. So we could show people what is underneath this kitchen. Because the first time we did this, everybody was kneeling down to have a look underneath to see what the hell was, uh, was underneath there. Like, do we have a Oompa Loompa doing something or what the hell is it? Something amazing happens over here. Let me take a moment to explain this to you. We don't just show this. We take the sensor, we put it in somebody's hand. We tell them to wet their finger on the tap, open the tap themselves, tap the sensor, and all of a sudden the magic happens. You know what the magic is. The lights flash, we'll have an iPad on the counter, notification comes up and they're like, wow. I must have this. I want this. This is so clever. Doesn't matter how much it costs because you've sold the functionality, but more important, you got them to do it. And you did something crucial by getting them to do it. What is it? You put a milestone, a memory milestone into their mind, something that they like, but they did it, so they're less likely to forget it. This is a bit like driving a car. If you sit in the passenger seat to learn a direction, you don't learn it, but if you sit behind the wheel to learn a direction, you generally remember it. So we take that approach with the demos, and as much as we can, get people to experience these reactions that you can get from Loxone on their own. So if we have a space where we're demonstrating how the lights go on and things like that, we push the customer first. So the music goes on for them first, the lights go on for them first, whatever function we're showing goes on for them first. It's a eureka moment. Do not underestimate the power of that. Demo, 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 demo. It's vital. If you have an opportunity, attend also an exhibition um, or attend a conference, uh, perhaps for architects or perhaps for engineers or MEPs attend in one form or another with a stand or sponsor it or something. It's powerful, it helps. Uh, this is a picture of a stand we did back in October. I swear on my life that till yesterday, I'm getting emails with requests from people who came there, spoke to us, picked up a card. When can we have an appointment? When can we come to our place? When can we do something? So I diverged there a little bit. Let's go back into how we approach the customer. After we've done all this demo, 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 we ask them a crucial question. Do you have an electrician? Now here, I'm going to share a little secret about our business model. In the very beginning, we thought, great, we're going to do everything in-house. 
we're the electricians ourselves. One or two of us have our head around config. We're going to grow as we need to grow organically. And this was the first business model, which you present to the bank, la, 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 la. We like to play with a little bit of lateral thinking. It doesn't mean we're experts at it, but we like a little bit of lateral thinking around here. And after some thought and approaching one or two consultants as well, uh, financial and stuff, we came to the conclusion that we wouldn't be very happy scaling our human resources um, because there's lots of big headaches that come with it. And then you just end up working for a massive company and worrying about paying the wages, basically. Sales become numbers, become paying the wages. And we thought, no, that's not fun. Fun is dealing with Mr. and Mrs. Client. Fun would be becoming automation specialists and pushing the boundaries of being automation specialists. And why can't we do it with electricians who are freelance at the same time or MEP companies and work with them? There is enough of the pie for both of us. So back to the question, do you have an electrician? Why is this an important question? Think about it for a moment. If they know an electrician or if they're a company working with an MEP company or an electrician, the likelihood is there's a bit of history over there. Either they've worked with the parents or they've worked with the company, whatever the history is, it means that this electrician, this professional has established trust with this prospective client that you're speaking to, which means that the client in turn values the advice of that professional. Now, whether they intended to or didn't intend to have this professional involved in what they're approaching you about for automation, be sure that before a person parts with a certain amount of money, they like to cross-check and take advice from trusted people. So how much does this professional know of Loxone, of automation, and of your company? Isn't it better if they're involved from the beginning, they're sold on your solution technically, and therefore they're singing from your song sheet and not telling the customer, well, I've never heard of Loxone, but Control 4 has been around the block for a few years. You're going to automatically lose the sale, no matter how hard you fought for it and how much you invested in your demos. At least that's what we found. We take it a step further. We involve or do our best to convince them to involve that professional in the actual installation. Because we've discovered that electricians love Loxone and tree technology especially. Now, right now, at this very moment in time, I know what you're thinking. This guy is an idiot because he's going to expose himself to all these other MEPs and electricians and everything. And they're just going to do a U-turn after the first project. They're going to look up the Loxone webpage. The next thing you know, they're contacting Richard or Tina and becoming partners themselves. And your business is taking a nosedive. Humor me a moment. Instead of like a little bit of lateral thinking. We'll come to that in a moment. We scaled our business to be specialists. Be sure that until today, we haven't changed our mind about keeping config and the commissioning of projects sacred in-house. That's done by our people, our employees, ourselves. Electricians in my part of the world, I don't know if it's the same for everybody else, they can hardly keep up. On most days, they're trying to figure out who they're going to disappoint. So we position ourselves from a business model to be their best asset. Now I'll say more about that in just a moment. Let's talk about that lateral thinking for a second. The big what if. What if these electricians become partners? There can be a silver lining if you look for it in anything in life. What would be the silver lining if you introduced a bunch of electricians and they became your competition? More people are talking about Loxone. Less people are talking about control for or whatever there is in the market, which means there's more buzz about Loxone going on. People want it. So your job is to get yourself out there because people shop around anyway and make sure that you're the one who gets chosen for Loxone and less people are talking about the competition and more people are talking about this fantastic 
brand we work with, live with, and love. Back to becoming an asset of the electrician. The way we do it is we take the lion's share of the planning, even if there are larger, more established MEP than we are. We don't try to necessarily own it all, but we'll take the lion's share. We'll do the, the, the grit, okay? We give them even a working order for the actual project itself, and we'll make sure we go the extra mile. For example, the image you can see behind me right now, all those green lines, and then they see little circles over there. The green lines are the steel studs for the gypsum guy. Nobody asked us to draw them. That's us going the extra mile. Why? Because we're going to make sure, number one, when the hole is cut for the light, we're not going to find any horrible steel in the way. Now, you might say, in my country, gypsum guy cuts the hole. It's his problem. Fine. But isn't it horrible when it happens and it slows down the project and there's arguments and stuff like that? In my neck of the woods, electricians and um, gypsum people aren't the best of friends on most days. So if we can facilitate a better working environment, it just takes an hour if it's an apartment, maybe a couple of hours or a day if it's a bigger project, but it's worth it because you position yourself to be the best friend of these people. And what happens? They promote you. I can tell you from practice, the amount of electricians we have, okay, it's not a massive amount, but from the amount of electricians we do have, I'd like to say that eight out of 10 of them bring us business because they love the way we work because we make their life easy and everything works. It makes sense. So what do we give to the client when it comes to quote time? Let's establish that we've done a demo and we've understood the interests of the client. Crucial, listen, ask questions, understand. We've got the blessing of the electrician because we've involved him or her in the project. So what's left is to present and knock their socks off. Now to do that, you have to have a nice template. We usually have a nice presentation kind of like the one I'm giving you, which sorry, I'm not sharing. It's not a secret. If you're interested, I can, I can share later on, but this is an idea of a template. There's a software, you reach out. I can tell you about it later. We make sure we include things like for each floor or each room, depending on who this, this template is for. The function, we don't sell a list. We don't give a list. It doesn't exist. We don't tell you how many switches and stuff. We tell you functionality, automation and override control of the lighting. We even spoon feed them in that way. It's not just automated, I can override it. Whew. Just in case they had some last minute worries. We tell them about the lock zone automation solution. We tell them how important sensors and interfaces are and spell it out to them. And then for every function, we tell them specific to their project, what we're offering and what it's going to do. So it's everything we've given them in the presentation in word form that they can take back basically with them. Now, after that, we will, if they really need numbers, we will give them uh, never the what you get out of config, never the first tab. We will usually give them the function tab and obviously add in there the fees we will charge them for doing config, which is very, very, very important. Now there, I'd like to pause a moment because Henning said something super interesting and, and I was writing lots of notes, Henning. And you said that the mini, I love this. You said the mini server is worthless without the programming. Guys, do not underestimate how much you are worth because we sell hardware from Loxone in the list, but that's not where the money is. The money is you, okay? Let's switch a moment because I know I'm over time and right now Gavin is looking at me like, you're not just sharing the spare time from Henning, you are eating into my time. I'm sure Richard will give you all of your time. Let's talk for a second about talking to difficult clients. I bring this up because I want to share, my nature is to share, and I'm sure we've all faced at one time or another a customer who turn up and say, I want a solution for this. I don't care about anything else. I only want lighting. Don't tell me about anything else. Maybe they think automation is just lighting. Guys, 
start by telling them what they want to know. Why? Because you listen, you ask questions, and don't frustrate a customer who's coming head on telling you, I'm only interested in this at first, okay? I'm not gonna spare all this out to you because you know the products and you should know the solutions as well. Tell them all about lighting in this case. I'm just using it as a scenario. We can, we can handle it all. 230 AC, 24 DC, dimming, dully, everything in between. How does it work? Tell them about automation. Tell them about how we do that. Tell them about lighting modes and functions and all of that. And find a way to tell them some stories that they can relate with. Richard, thank you. When you sent us the passionate video the other day, you mentioned Home Alone. So I'm going to pick on that. That was a really great one, which you planted in here and it stayed. We all know Home Alone. It's a fantastic comedy movie. And it's probably one of the few comedies that's been translated into every language that there is on the planet. So relate with the customer. Tell them, hey, you remember when Kevin McCulkey had all those cardboard cutouts and he made the whole house look like there was a party. It wasn't that great. And, yeah, and then the robbers didn't come in that night. So he had time to prepare for the next day. Present simulation. We give you that. It's part of what we do. Yes, you, depending on difficult, not difficult customer, we throw it in or we can add it easily. Depends on how you want to monetize this. Notice our choice of words here. We never said if you buy, if we integrate, if you go for, if we add. We feed on the reaction of the customer. We try to tell them stories until we get one that resonates with them. Once, once we've struck that chord, we're like, ah, that's what makes you tick. You know, then we can strike curiosity. And that usually leads to clients opening up and wanting to know more. And you can always strike more interest if you get through to a client with a story, especially a tough client. And remember, don't frustrate them. Avoid debate because it never ends well. And on that note, I will end right now. I'm sure Richard will share details later on. Um, so just in case you're doing screenshots, here's mine. I think I've moved the chair a hundred times and moved the green screen now as well. So I shut up now. You have been on fire, Nick. Thank you for this for this wonderful presentation. I I think it's it's brilliant. So everybody throw in a, a a digital applause in the chat. <laughs> I never thought I would say this ever. <laughs> Thank you. I, I have one up my sleeve, by the way, but I'll save that for later. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I love the way the way you presented it. I love the, the way you showcased to us the power of demonstration uh, that you are the asset on the on the building side, and I can I can truly believe that everybody who works with you and your company really loves to, and will do this in the future again. So awesome, really, really awesome. So Gavin's turn now, and I am super excited for this one as well because Gavin has a super rough market, because honestly. Uh, Dubai is a little different than Austria and Germany and Switzerland, so it was always difficult for, for, for me at least to assist you on this topic. That's why I'm even happier that you found yourself for yourself a way to, to step into this market. Gavin is actually coming from the UK as a Luxon partner and now moved to Dubai. And also, in my opinion, he has one of the most exclusive showrooms around the world. And maybe you can also, I'm also allowed to share uh, the website or the video of your showroom by tomorrow's email. Maybe. We'll see. We'll see. <laughs> uh, right. So thanks, Nick. Penning, Richard. Um, I'm not quite sure, really, to be fair, how I'm going to follow Nick or Henning, for that matter. Um, I don't know if you guys notice that my camera keeps going blurry. Nick's got green screens. I've got a blurred face. So we'll, we'll see what happens. Um, so, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm over in Dubai. Uh, I run uh, a tune. And as, uh, as Richard said, I started out in the UK originally and then moved over here when most of my work was over here. Um, so over here is very difficult to get directly with end customers. So we tend to go a lot via architects. 
Um, so I'm going to quickly talk to you about architects uh, and the tender process that we come up against quite a lot, and then a little bit about investors uh, at the end. So uh, I suspect, you know, many of you will currently be dealing primarily with the property owners themselves. And you may have had dealings with architects on some of your projects, uh, but you may not have been kind of considered architects as a potential route to the market themselves. But consider this, you know, every architect, architect firm you partner with is another sales team and one you don't really have to pay for other than some of your kind of time and energy. Uh, and whilst, you know, going down the architect's route is generally a longer sales cycle, this itself does have its advantages for your business. Once you're involved in their projects, because they're a longer cycle and a longer process to get involved with, it allows you to schedule them in your timeline, allowing you to plan and forecast further into the future, both for your resources and financially, which is really, really helpful. Some of the projects that I'm working on currently with some of the architects I'm involved with here are not planning to break ground until 2023, some even 2024. So I can see I've got, I've got forecast much, much further down the line. Uh, and really all it takes is just to do training with them and then nurture and, and support them uh, as much as we can. So, you know, kind of what's in it for them? And I was totally forgetting to click the forward bits on my slides because I'm too busy talking. So what's in it for them? We approach architects and designers with kind of a three-stage training approach. So firstly, we offer uh, like a smart home presentation, which is quite unbiased and primarily actually non locks on because it's a talk about smart home technology and the future where it's going uh, and what the functions and features are a few years ago in the uk you could do a, a reba cpd course um which with architects that are accredited to reba they have to do a certain number of development points every year to keep their accreditation so we use that we use that to get into the architects because even if they're not accredited, they understand that the CPDs are not sales meetings. They're educational. They're designed to teach people about what's going on in the market, what's trending in the way of this technology. So they're more open to you going in and presenting to them and telling them about you and the technology. I've done some uh, sort of initial meetings with architects firms where I've been in front of 12, 13, 14 architects at once. And ultimately, these guys, they're not becoming part of your sales team, because when they're talking to their clients, they're then, oh, smart home technology, do you want this for your home? So it's a great way to approach it, position it as this is educational. I'm not coming to sell you my company. I'm not coming to sell your locks on, I'm coming to teach you about smart home, about the future and where properties ultimately are gonna be going in the future. I then move into like a stage two and I've got a, a almost like a, a presentation that I do to them which called it starts with design. And that's a bit more technical, you know, it's more about the wiring changes the design changes and things that have to be taken into account for a successful smart home solution. The, you know, the, it's the differences in the lighting circuits, you know, traditional properties being wired in a loop for, for the lighting down to a switching wire, not very helpful for us for automation. So it's teaching the architects that there are differences in design that they should be taking into account when de developing properties. Um, and things like switches, you know, you see an architect's design when they put light switches at the entrance to every room. Do we want that? No, because with a smart home, you should walk into the room, the lights should turn on. If you're sitting at your dining table entertaining your guests, you don't want to have to get up, walk across the room to change your lighting. You don't necessarily want to put out your phone to change the mood change the audio. You wanna reach behind and touch a switch on the wall or touch on the desk. You know, so it's about educating them into designing properties from the start 
with smart home technology in mind. So those sort of first two stages there are to help build credibility, to help them see that you're the expert, that you know what you're talking about. And then we move on to the third stage with working with a couple of people in the firm and really then training them on lots on, training them on the features, the functionality, so that they can then present that to the end clients and get them on board with putting smart home technology and lots on into their new build property. Um, now, as a company, we do a design service and we do this a lot for architects firms where we will sit and design the full automation package for the property. And we do charge a fee for that service. And it's up to the architects to kind of sell that to their clients and the people that are looking to build the property. And um, the way we get them to position it is when an architect's sitting there designing the floor plans and the layouts, they'll have a specialist, either externally or internally, that deals with lighting design, kitchen planning, landscapes. So why would they not have a specialist design the aspect of their property that is so advanced, so technology driven? Why would you just let the normal kind of MEP guys do that kind of level of design? Why not get someone specialist to do it? And I've had some instances on projects in the past where They've said from the start, they want automation. They want a control system. And we said, okay, fine. You know, we can do this for you. Based on your ceiling plans, your lighting circuits, your blinds, it's going to cost, say, $25,000. We've then gone to site after doing all the designs and presented it to MEP. And they said, but hang on, we already given MEP drawings. We've already cabled it to what we've been given. We can't change this now. You've got to redesign the system. So we had to go back to the drawing board and swap out things like relay extensions to use uh, nano relay two trees. So we could switch the lighting circuits locally. The price went from $25,000 to $60,000 because of the way we had to adapt the system to work with the cabling that had been done. Ultimately, the end client said, well, I'm not paying the extra. I'm going to cut out some functionality, forget a few rooms, and we kind of met in the middle, but they didn't ultimately get what they want because it hadn't been designed properly in the first place. And then there was another project where this one was a very large commercial offices over three stories, they had uh, 220 private offices and they wanted full automation with lighting control, HAVAC, blinds, access control, the full works. And we sat down, looked at their designs that they've done already. And we said, yeah, that's about $95,000. But the way they were doing the zonal AC control there was all with VAVs, which was gonna cost them about $120,000 just for the VAVs. So I said, no, wait, wait, wait. Get rid of the VAVs, we'll use locks on dampers. Easier to install, far more cost-effective solution. I can give you the locks on dampers for this project. It's gonna be about another $40,000. So ultimately, we're saving them $120,000 and the automation system they want is therefore actually only gonna cost them $16,000 when you look at it like that. But that can only be done at design, right at the start, which is why it's important if you get into the architects, get them to get you involved in the project as early on, because there are things which you can propose and change, which means you can give the end client more of what they want with a more cost-effective way of doing it. So, where did I get to? 
Now, one of the things that we do when we've trained up these guys of how to kind of position locks on to their clients and get the client interested, we say to them, you know, once you've got them, say, on the hook, get us in, get us to present to them, get us to talk to them properly and talk to them about what it is they need, what their desires are, as Nick said, what are their pain points? So we can really help them tailor the system down. And we try and then, obviously, if the architect agrees, to engage with them directly. So we have that long-standing relationship with the client. It also means then if the project goes out to tender, we're already in there. We don't have to then fight with people on the tender process because we've got a, a relationship established with the client. But that's not to say that that always happens. We quite often get involved in the tender process. And quite often the, the architects know how it's gonna to go to tender. But I'll come on to that again in a second. So just to kind of recap, what, what do the architects themselves get out of working with us? They get the training and they get the education and they get the upskilling of their staff. They get less time working on some aspects of the project because we're doing a lot of the cabling design. They get more credibility from their client because their client can see they're involving an expert rather than trying to sort of dabble in it themselves and provide the service. But as I said earlier, we provide, we do this for a fee. We don't do it free. But what we do do is if we then are successful in getting the final project, we refund the design fee back to the architects as a way of us saying thank you to them for getting us involved. One of the other documents that we often give to architects is a tender specification document, which I've got a few extracts of on the screen. This is not locks on related, but it is. If you see some of the bits on the screen and I'm happy to share this with people afterwards, if you want to start going down the route of getting involved in tenders and architects, this document's great because I have five or six architects over here now that use this document on every project they send out because it's got technical specifications in there. So what happens is when this gets sent out to five or six other companies that do Control 4 or that do Crestron or Lutron, they don't match the specification. You see, like here, switch actuators localized, bus line powered, no configuration or logic stored within the device, two relay outputs. It's a nano relay two tree, right? But it doesn't say it on there. 10.2 interconnection between the main module link provides via a direct wire connection or over the building Ethernet backbone without additional modules. Bye bye, KNX. <laughs> Smart switch, no moving parts, five touchable points, integrated temperature and humidity. We all know what that one is. So it's a way of locking it down to locks on without writing locks on. And it doesn't come from us, it comes from the architect as part of the tender package. But when people start looking into it, locks on is the only thing they can use because it's the only thing that matches spec, usually. Because inversely of that, there are times when I get specs, which locks on doesn't match, but I still tender for it. And I'll come back to that now. So tenders, don't be scared of them. Now, to some people, you say the word tender and they think, oh, it's this massive big process. And it is, but don't let it scare you. Because ultimately, all it is is a, an official process of gathering quotes, but also making sure those quotes comply with the design intent and come from a reputable company. So kind of with that in mind, just be prepared. Obviously, if you've been involved with the architect on the project already, you're going to have most of the information. And they would already have been able to tell you what route it was going to tender if it was going to go out on like a, a tendering system on the internet, whether it was going to be sent out to 
five or six specific construction companies, they'll know the process. Now, as I said earlier, there's, there's kind of two parts once it gets to this stage. Either you've been involved in the project with the architect and the client's already tied you into it, or you've done all the design work, the specification yourself for the project, and it goes out, make sure it's got your name on it. Not the generic spec doc that I just mentioned, but if you've done all the design and everything else, make sure your name's on there. I get emails of inquiries coming in three, four times a week for projects that I've specified with people sending me my documents back saying, can you supply the equipment? How much for? Lost track of my notes. So with the, I always do this. With the, the tender process, as I said, you know, it's about them getting the information from you. So just make sure you've got everything ready. They'll want things like trade licenses, insurance, company profiles, sometimes the owner's CVs if they're really specific, but details of like previously awarded projects and approvals. And the thing is when you get inquiries come through with regards to tenders, ring the contractors that are contacting you because they already know who you are because they've just sent you an inquiry. So ring them, discuss it, but then say, have you got any other projects that we might be able to help you on that you can send us the details through? The estimators at these companies, make them your friends because they'll quite often give you the inside track. Now, once you get the, once the contract has been awarded, who's going to do the job, they'll nearly always come back to their suppliers and say, we need a discount. And they'll be expecting or assuming a discount. So build it in from the start. Even if it's only a few percent, build it in there. And then the value engineering stage. Some of you may know the term. Personally, it's a term that gets mentioned in the UAE seven times for every project because they're always trying to scale it back, scale it back all the time. And it's basically a way of cost cutting and reducing the, the cost of a job. But again, be prepared. It can be things like removing touch pures and just putting touch. Reducing the number of speakers in a room taking away a touch surface, as much as I love touch surface, and it pains me to take it off of a project, it's more of a nice to have than a required for, for most projects, right? But be prepared to make those changes and pull the specification back slightly because they, they wanna save money. Now, the thing is with these, these kind of tender projects, they are generally larger in value. And you need, People think a big team, but you don't. I haven't got a huge team here in Dubai. Just before Christmas, we were running 17 projects at once because we're working with the MEP guys. A bit like Nick said, you know, we have the guys come to us. We specified, we designed everything. We gave them the drawings, we gave them the equipment. They installed it all. We then went to site and programmed. The only thing I will say about that is if you build it into your, your project that the MEP is going to install it, make sure you build in some time for you to hold the hand and go and visit site constantly, check the work they're doing, test things, because it will save you a lot of time when it comes to commissioning. Now we use a fantastic tool here for doing our proposals and our drawings and our project management. Um, it's good for every kind of market, for the, for the commercial market, when you're dealing with the customers directly. Um, I personally love it, this tool, when I go out to end clients, because I can walk around, create the rooms. Yeah, I want that in there, I want that function, I want that function, I want that function. And it brings a proposal up on the screen, broken down by system or function, not by parts. I can show them a parts list and it can show them a price. And they can say, yeah, I like that. And they sign it on the screen there and then they're not shopping around so much. If they like what you're doing, they don't need to. They've got it there, but I'm kind of going off on a tangent. That software, what that does for us is when we're 
doing these large projects, we do all the planning on that. And as we drop on a presence sensor or we drop on a switch, it gives it a component ID, all unique. So when we order the equipment in, the first thing we do is we label everything. We print stickers out of the software and we've got a switch, might be conference room one, SW001, 002. This matches the drawing. So when the contractors get the kit, they go, 001, conference room one, conference room one. Oh yeah, could be master bedroom, could be dining room, kitchen, whatever. They've got it there, they know exactly where that kit goes. Take it out of the box, install it. It makes it easier. And as we're labeling it, we're noting down serial numbers so that we can quickly and easily then commission the projects. And then uh, one of the other parts of the tendering process usually is a compliance statement, or as I put there, a non-compliance statement. I get a lot of tenders through where someone says, oh, can you give us a price for the controls for this, price for the automation for this? And I often hear people say, oh, I'm not going to do with this tender because we don't comply with spec. But what we've found over the last couple of years is complying is actually okay, not complying, sorry, is actually okay. So long as you can justify it and there's a good reason. When you're sent a specification doc that isn't locked on, you know, you can easily turn it around. I've recently won a, a, a new hotel being built uh, by a well-known international brand in Dubai. Uh, I'm not sure if I can tell you the chain, but if you want a holiday in Dubai, it might be a good choice. Um, so the specification on there stated a list of approved manufacturers and Loxon wasn't on it. But we submitted, um, we simply stated that the equipment we intended to supply was an established brand outside of the approved manufacturers list and that on some points we didn't comply. But there was a reason why we didn't comply and we justified it. So then the consultant sat back and looked, okay, well, it doesn't meet this specification that we were supposed to, but... It doesn't because of this, which is actually okay. It meets our budget. It actually gives us more than we were gonna get from this other systems. Let's go with it. And that's the best way to deal with a non locks on specification that ever come through. Admit, I don't comply. And this is why. And this is why you should still pick locks on. If you've not been involved in tenders before, find, in your, your region, how to get involved in tenders. As I said, there are some web portals in some countries you can use. Sometimes it's just registering yourself with the contractors. Get some through. If you don't want them, tender anyway. Get used to the process. Once you start doing a few, you'll build up like a document library of things that always get asked. So you've got them there, which makes when you go to tender at a later stage, very, very easy and very, very quick. So just quickly to, to touch on investors. Obviously, you know, the uh, homeowners, they're investors, property developers. So you know, I could go into for several hours about all the different types of investors we have uh, and how to kind of attack each one. But ultimately, what they are looking for? A return. You know, and it's it's not, it's not just about how much money they get back in the long run. It's about how much they can save throughout the investment period. You know, and quite often, I think people, uh, especially if you've got people involved with locks on, one of the big things they always jump to is energy savings. And whilst that is important, there are lots of other things to consider. You know, for example, uh, a property investor decides to build uh, apartments in central London to let them out as Airbnbs. But using Loxon can help with the management costs because you can reset each apartment to defaults and control access remotely from the phone, potentially even integrate it into a booking system. No need to employ someone for, to, to let these people into the property or reset the lighting scenes. 
So you know, you're reducing the management cost. You can help with the maintenance because if the apartment isn't rented out for some time, this is where like the frost protection and overheat protection come in. Opening valves that haven't moved for a few weeks, operating blinds. These are all ways that are reducing costs, which adds to the return on the investment. And yet, yeah, you know, energy saving with turning off the lights, disabling the heat and cooling when it's not occupied. Also very, very important. So, you know, there was, when I was back in the UK, there was some studies conducted where it, one of them demonstrated that having a fully automated property could save up to around 40% on energy costs. And with the rising cost of energy over a three to five year period, that's a fair saving to shout about. And sellability, another one I saw showed how Properties of the same type, one automated, one not. The automated one is three times more likely to sell and at or closer to the asking price than one that's without. And these are the facts and figures and also the features and functions that investors will be interested in. So I think that's pretty much all for me for now. Um, I hope everyone's enjoyed that. Um, I certainly enjoyed Nick's and Henning's. It's good to speak to you all, thanks. Thank you very much on this, Kevin. This was super exciting and I got like a ton of questions privately in the chat. If you would be so kind to share some more details about the, for, for all of you guys, for also for, for you, Nick, to share the details of the softwares that you are using. And maybe we can discuss afterwards if we can, uh, if we can send this by tomorrow, by tomorrow's email, or if maybe then we send it a day, a day later, but then it's even more valuable for you guys and I, I love the way how how you how you said that you use the architects as your sales guys because I, i'd love to have people working for me that i don't have to pay <laughs> so I, I understand the concept yeah i've got loads <laughs> <laughs> um also what, what what you said is like you design properly in the first place to to save a lot of money afterwards that's that's super super true to me this always was an approach for switzerland as and as there are a lot of swiss partners here uh tonight with us we we will also go a step the extra mile there and also make webinars especially for planners and investors for switzerland maybe this makes sense internationally as well and I love that, I, I mean, I've heard of, of Tinder influencers, but not of Tender influencers yet. And, <laughs> <laughs> and I, I, love, I love both ways that you put locks on into the tenders and that you also turn around those tenders. So this is brilliant. And I can just appreciate again the time. So I am super proud that I have partners like you all, but you especially, Gavin, who is working on 17 projects and still finds the time to share his knowledge with all of us tonight. And it's, this is just super, super exciting to me. And, You're very welcome. And if I, if I, if I sum up the, the whole presentation for, for all of you guys, we, we saw there is different markets, there is different situations. Henning, as who, who was explaining us from the electrician's perspective, dealing exactly or directly with the end customer, the one who moves into the building. Nick showing us the way how he scales his business, working with different, different people, electricians, the Gibson guys and everything. And also you, Gavin, taking responsibility of tenders on the market, catching them, turning architects into sales guys. I think this was super, super awesome. And one thing or a few things that all of you guys had in common well, this, and I have a super bad handwriting. You sell functionalities, you ask questions, you listen, and you showcase. This is the four steps which I noted for all of you are the same. And I truly believe that we should find a way that our labor, so I, I want to change the mindset out there. I'd like, I'd like to get out of this price downwards spiral where, where the electrician or, the, or we guys are just relying on hardware margins and nobody's really, so what is our work, our know-how work? And I believe that Loxon can have, I, I truly believe this, that we can showcase with functionalities, with our know-how put into the paper on the config to really create automation and go go away from this control like when when people tell me i have smart blinds and i say yeah show me <laughs> i i always love to say yeah it's cool show me and they're controlling it with their phone i say hey what's the difference from controlling it with your phone than controlling it here on a 
on a push button. There is no, it's about automation. So I think Nick made a cool point where he draws the line between control and automation. And what else can I say? Yeah, there is, there is days at, at Loxone where I really like my job. And there is other days like tonight where I really, really love my job. And at the end, I'd like to point out that we have a super, super great partner community, the Luxon family out there. It's unbelievable to me how much effort all you three guest speakers uh, put into the presentations. And I'm super glad that you shared all this knowledge with all of us. And I would, I would really like to grow our partner community to go further steps with all of you participants tonight. And we at Luxon, we are already thinking about new cool features, new formats and everything. And one very underestimated function or something very underestimated to me still is the Luxon library. And I'm not sure how many of you guys really use it. And this to me is like the perfect example how Luxon partners work with one another. And I, I just want to, to quickly point it out. Um, it's called library.loxon.com and you can find templates which are, which are some of them. It's not most of them. Some of them are created by us, by Loxon, but most of them are created by partners who share their pain and knowledge about creating this template, making it work. And then they say, hey, if somebody else has the same, I don't know, HVAC system or whatever we filter like climate system, and then you guys can see it and you can use the same stuff and you can download these templates and import it into the config. And then it's just a template as we're used to. And um, yeah, it's not loading right now. That's super unfortunate. Now oh, there it is. <laughs> so for instance, I don't know, this, this Wolf Airflow stuff. You can download this template here and then in the config you can, you can choose the extension um, and you can insert the template and then you have all these stuff inside. And this is one example on where looks on community is gonna go and yeah what, what else can i see i mean i i also want to point out that Luxon last year we hired 60 or 70 maybe maybe one of the the colleagues from from me can write in the chat i think it's 70 uh new people last year where other companies said like ah with the pandemic let's let's see let's 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 go down with business we said no we really want to push forward we i mean you you guys probably know about the campus project we are currently building which is a 60 million euro investment with like a warehouse which we can only dream of with 6000 square meters 10 meters high i'd really like i, re I really have to to finally have this one and also for the international team, and most of, of you partners uh, joining us tonight come from our department, and we will hire also six new people in the international team to be, to be there for you. And I always say the job of, of my employees, the, the only job, the true job, is to be there for you. Your success as a partner should be our business. And every day I go to work, I keep this in mind, and I really like to, to motivate our people to contact you, to bring value to you. So please take this chance. They, they only have a job as long as you consume their knowledge. So be nice to them. And <laughs> I shouldn't say that, <laughs> but you, you know what I mean? Please use them. They should, they should be in contact with you. I'd, I'd love to assist you either in the, in the planning, how to make offers, to use functionalities. I mean, I, I, I figured out that a lot of you didn't even know about this this page here right where is it here the calculation page and there's there is nice tina talking on the left hand side but also there is there is uh, an example of a 120 square meter house and i can i can post this now in the chat if you'd like and this is coming from our colleagues in czech republic they made this this cool proposal hey let's make a clever package with 36 functions and this is what it costs but forget about this price i don't sell Panic mode, motion-based la motion based lading. Pan well, it's it's now a long a long day. Even if I didn't talk so much, <laughs> motion-based lighting, a panic button, a fire detection, window monitoring, alarms. Don't say this. Sell this for two and a half k. No, be your own boss when it comes to your margins. Your know-how as an automation guy, an automation specialist, is worth the money. Otherwise, they can they can buy stuff in the in the electronic markets and do it themselves if it's just about control. But we are doing automation. 
premium package, like 4.5K. There's also dimmable light. There is the 36 functions. And uh, in total, it's 55 dimmable light, shading, other features. And the premium package, the Ferrari that you can buy, is the exclusive one. Still a 120 square meter house, like for 11,000 euros. You get all this colored lighting, multimedia access control, and more and more and more. And we go one step further here. We even describe how lighting is working, how present simulation is working. Because I feel you guys, I know as an electrician, how you are used to work, how to import those data from what's the mini server article number, the price and everything to click one button to create an offer. I know this and I felt super sad when I realized that a lot of partners in the group did not really see it that way, that you can make proposals like this. This is present simulation. And maybe some of you already figured out that all this here is just a description of what the auto configuration does. And once you really start working like this, then you can be the one deciding, hey, how much do I sell the alarm system for? The Kevin alone at home function. This is where I'd like to, to bring all of you as a partner. This is what my vision for, for this year is. And now I'm, I'm getting higher in percentage of talking time, so I want to, <laughs> to interrupt myself here, and I'd like to open up a discussion round with you guys now. So if you have any questions right now, please ask them in the chat. And maybe I unspotlight myself, so it's all of us. Richard, our gallery. Yes. still people ask questions. I just wanted to add something to what you were just saying just now. Don't be afraid of customers with low budgets or customers saying, but I don't have the money or I don't afford it. Because you can help a customer by planning advance. We have customers in-house. They start with a small budget. They spent more already. And we've got conduits in their place. And in two years time, we'll install an awesome audio system for them. It's the customer's job to worry about the budget. If you demo, 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 and get them to feel those things, like I was saying in the presentation, they want it. They'll find the money. That's not your problem. Don't fit what they say. Show off what you can do as function and help show them that they don't have to do it from day one. You can plan for it and add it. It's a little tip that helps a lot. Cable you know, for everything. Sorry? I say cable for everything to start with, right from day one. Even if you're not putting all 20 blinds, put the cable in. Because yep. it's a damn sight easier to do it later if the cable's already there. Yep. <clears throat> so there's a lot of questions about your book, Kevin. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Thanks, Nick. <laughs> there's actually two books. <laughs> oh, really? Now you're showing off, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you about them another time. I'm not yeah. going to use this platform to come out my book <laughs> sorry <laughs> so, it's all right no i'll tell you fine uh, it was more designed to help generate leads than anything else yeah it's going to be advertised on places like property finder in the uae where people are looking to buy a property they can download a free copy of the book by clicking a link and filling out a form so i have their details as i said in the talk earlier on it's very difficult to get to end customers here because the estate agents that sell the properties have got all these little tie-ins. It's very, very clicky. And trying to break down those barriers of these relationships that have been going on for 10, 15, 20 years is hard. So I'm taking a different approach. So I've, I've written a book about buying a smart home, really unbiased, mentions locks on more than anything else, but it, it's an unbiased look at smart home technology and comparing ecosystems to IoT uh, and stuff like that. And... Um, my theory was to get copies of the books as well printed, leave it with the architects so that when they have clients come in and want to talk about smart home technology, they can say, well, look, we've got a book here. You can read all about it. And actual fact, the guy that wrote it lives in Dubai and has a company. He can do your smart home. So it adds a bit of credibility to me and my company at the same time. And the second book is my design for automation book, which is designed purely as an educational resource for architects so that they understand a bit more about technology and smart home technology going into properties and what they should and shouldn't be thinking about. And it's a great read. Thanks. 
Brilliant. So there's one question to earn. There's many questions now. So let's kick it off with the first one. If the, cast, the customer asks about the price firstly, what to do? Who of you guys want to, <laughs> to jump I in? I get this question, that question a lot of times. Um, and uh, as Ahmad uh, is writing here, uh, can I use the answer? It depends. Yes, exactly. That's what you can. You can say it depends. Take this switch, it can do a lot of things. And it, it, and it depends. The plastic thing on the wall is the plastic thing on the wall or the glass one if you have the pure, but it depends. Program it, what the function, which functions do you want? Uh, let's talk about your home. How do you want to live there? Then I can give you a price for a solution. And to me, to me, the reason why we designed this three offer page was to give a rough idea. Like this 120 square meter house is like something, okay, some people might have less, some people might have more, but they have like a rough idea. Like if I have a 150 square meter, okay, it might be slightly more, but that's what's the whole idea. And if you for yourself can make the price that you want to, to sell this for, the clever package, the two and a half thousand euros Luxon components, maybe installed uh, and programmed could be five or 6,000 euros. I don't know. Then we're talking about a margin of 100% all of a sudden. And if you have this and don't say like, hey, this is the mini server, eight valves, seven relays, blah, blah, blah. No, but this is the 36 functions, this, 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 this. And only for 6K, you will get this. This was the idea. Ask them if it's their dream home and they're going to live in it forever. And then you can go into functionality and investing in your home. And if it's not, and they might move on, ask them this question. Would you buy a brand new car from the 90s today in the 20s, 2020s? It comes with great wind up windows, neck twisting, reverse parking, wrestling, steering wheel, and you can sing your own tunes unless you decide to opt for the additional radio. Because that's an analogy we use, especially with investors. I think the future of homes, okay, property is different, it's not a car, but the future of homes is gonna be harder to sell. And I think Gavin, you mentioned something about this, about properties um, getting more value with automation. And I think when you try to sell your house in five years or 10 years time, the argument from the buyer is going to be, ah, but I have to invest so much in automation. You need to say, I'm only willing to give you so much. Whereas if you make your house more buyable now, that's a line you can use to first time buyers who maybe are buying small today. When the family grows, they'll buy bigger. And it's just a stupid analogy. Anyway, I had it up. Myself. So there's another question to the three musketeers. Okay, I understood. Which types of switches are preferred in your territory? Is there a KNX a topic or, I mean, it's, it's from, from, from Senk, the question. I hope I understood correctly. I can have a comment with this one as well. Uh, for me, it's a no-brainer. Uh, that two, that's two reasons for that. As Nick, uh, Nick demonstrated earlier, uh, the tree bus is extremely efficient. Uh, it's a no-brainer. Uh, the Luxone components are so full of functions and it's so easy to program uh, compared to KNX or anything else. Uh, so on, on that note, I will also give a really high recommendations to continuously use the auto config. <laughs> it's a great way of earning money. <laughs> you can program a whole house in a, a fraction of the time, what you would do with mechanics switches. And also if the customer wants some fancy smancy um, frames around the switches, yeah, the, the ordinary touch tree is fit perfectly in a 55 millimeter frame. There is a tough one. It's a chicken and egg question. What to say to the customer if he asks for previous projects or for references when you haven't done any yet? Always be honest. Demo. Demo, demo, demo. Do it at cost price. Get yourself, you know, look, you're going to get yourself a full smart home at cost price. I get myself a reference site. Let's help each other out. I remember our very first project, we swapped, we managed to sell some RGB spots. And for the price of the RGB spots, we swapped three pendulums, which we paid the difference in the price ourselves. And customer is your ambassador. He will sell you to the next person and the next person, and he did. 
Can I just go back to the locks on KNX switch question? Of course. Right. So I quite often, as you know, deal with architects and designers who love the fact that <gasps> KNX has got such a range of different accessories to look at. To, I'm like, yeah, you're interested in the KNX switches because you don't understand automation. If you understood automation, you wouldn't care what the switch was on the wall. Let me teach you about locks on. Let me show you the switch and how it works. They soon change their mind. So switch or not to switch, <laughs> that's the point. You have to educate them. That's why you need to understand their understanding. This is it. They don't need the switch. We sell the switch because it's got a, you know what? We promote the touch even though we have the touch and it's great and the T5, we promote the temperature sensor and the humidity sensor inside it even more. That's why we want it on the wall. Otherwise we don't even need it. That's brilliant. So if any marketing colleagues of mine are in the webinar tonight, I want a green screen for that reason. <laughs> I can send you an Amazon.de link. <laughs> All right. So I as, I, as I wrote in the chat sometimes previously, I'm super super happy that you all agreed that we can share your contact details in tomorrow's email. So every interested partner can reach out to you. Maybe we four together can have a quick, uh, a quick talk tomorrow. Maybe we can directly share some. There was a lot of questions about the programs you guys using. Gavin's, lots of Gavin's books. You <laughs> <laughs> have to write another one. <laughs> 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 how, how to deal with Austrian manufacturers. <laughs> <laughs> That'll be a thick book. <laughs> Can I write one? Edit, I will one. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I, I was, I, again, again, just say it again, I'm super excited for, for, for what's happening tonight. And I really love the fact that so many people of you stayed like for the presentations, like we have only five people who left the webinar it never happened to me again. So like everybody joined, stayed, joined and stayed in the webinar. The attendance rate is crazy. So there was a super high demand for this webinar. The recording will be sent out to you guys in the newsletter tomorrow or the day after. And what else? What did I want to say? Yes, I, if there is no more questions, I'd really like to thank you three guys for, for showcasing, giving us some insights tonight. And to, to end all this, I'd like to point out that we as the electricians, people should start seeing us as for what we are. And to me, we are godlike creatures who have the power <laughs> over light or no light. Isn't that true? <laughs> So let's let's keep let's make them understand that our know-how is worth paying some extra to receive an awesome, perfect home. Because just imagine how much money you spend for a freaking kitchen or freaking bathroom, and the electricity system or the the, the electrical part, which stay in the house for like for ages more. Sometimes people don't realize the value. So let's show them the value. Let us from Loxon help you on this. We do some marketing stuff for you to make it even easier. We do things like tonight with the webinar, we share the knowledge of our most successful partners. And yeah, maybe you can give a quick digital applause with a thumbs up in the chat for our great speakers tonight. And yeah, let's let's go. And then I, I was thinking about making this myself, but it was kind of weird if it's just me that you hear. <laughs> I'll, I'll kick it off for Henning and Gavin. Thank you, guys. It was a real pleasure listening, listening to both yeah, of you. Yeah, thank awesome. you. Well done. It really, really was. Very good. Really, really thank awesome. Guys. I'm going to be yep. attacking your WhatsApp, Gavin. Lots of questions. Yeah. No worries. Appreciate <laughs> it, guys. Okay. So have a nice evening, everybody. I was, I was, I was thinking like because for some people it's not even evening that's so crazy about like people from all around the world are joining us tonight gin o'clock thank you for having yes. us <laughs> yeah guys guys thanks see you bye. thanks for tonight thank you bye take bye. care bye guys <laughs>